if you can read the signs, they are all there for you. Yes, what does this auger, what are we actually seeing? What do these mysterious black and white shapes mean, actually? Well, if you're the type of person who likes to read English, you can see that it says Mr. M. Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. And if you can read the English and translate the word you just read into actual meaning, then you will know that that is my mailing address. And of course you might wonder, well, who is me? Well, me is me, Malcolm Tent. Yes, your host. Every week around this time and place for Tent Talks Tunes. Coming right at you. Maybe not technically in 3D, but as I inspect my surroundings, and uh, check the corpus, I see that I am definitely here in three dimensions, minimum, minimum guaranteed three dimensions, beaming out to you live through the ether into a very two-dimensional format. Whether it be the weekly live broadcast on Facebook or archived forever on YouTube, on my fabulous YouTube channel, to which you should subscribe. If you haven't, if you've not have not subscribed yet, you really should subscribe. There's a lot of good stuff on my YouTube channel. That is the repository of my permanent record. I'm sure you remember in school, if you acted up or misbehaved, you were threatened that your misbehavior would go onto your permanent record. And at the time, that seemed like a pretty heavy threat. You know, I mean, no one ever explained exactly what the permanent record was. But it was sort of understood that you didn't want your bad behavior on the permanent record. Well, guess what, kids? Now we've got a permanent record. It is here. It is now. If it's not archived on Facebook, it's archived on YouTube. But guess what? I signed up for it willingly. I punched that clock. I haven't punched out yet. I am putting all this stuff onto, I guess you would call it, the cloud, whether it be on YouTube or here on Facebook. At any rate, I'm here, you're here with me, welcome. Let's check the monitor status to make sure that we are indeed going out live and uh, maybe get a quick thumbnail sketch to see who's tuned in. Yep, we got the um, we got the captions on, I don't know why. I really hope that they miscaption me because that kind of stuff is funny. It's, uh, it's almost like watching a Japanese monster movie from the 60s and 70s. I've got the thumbnail sketch. It says Mike from Vancouver is tuned in. My old pal Shannon Naff, formerly of Marion, Virginia's favorite hardcore sons, the sarcastic assholes. And the initials of that band, in case you were wondering, is TSA. I'm just going to leave it at that. So Shannon, thanks for tuning in. Elvis Irwin from the great state of Texas is tuned in. Alan from somewhere is tuned in. Mal Anowski from the great Willimantic Records in Willimantic, Connecticut is tuned in. Thanks all guys for joining me. All right, enough fall to raw. Let's get right down to biz, shall we? First thing we got to do is check the bulletin board. The bulletin board is actually a little bit quiet these days because I've got some stuff coming up that precludes too much action in the field. In about three weeks, I am voluntarily, I don't know if voluntarily is really the right, right word, but I've finally made the decision to go under the surgeon's knife and get my defective left wrist fixed. If y'all want to know the gory details about that, message me. I'll, I'll show you x-rays. I'll tell you every detail about it you ever wanted to know. It's quite a silly story. Um, I guess the lesson that is to be learned from the story of my having to get my wrist operated on is if you're 19 years old, don't do anything stupid like try to climb up the side of a building. Nothing good will result of it. I'm here to testify to that. I will testify in a court of law as to that fact. Don't do it. 
So because of that, um, there's not a whole lot of gigs happening for the foreseeable future. Um, there are some road and field events. I guess we'll talk about them. We've got the Punk Rock Flea Market coming up in Southbury, Connecticut on July 17th, which is a few days before my surgery. I'm going to be there with a couple of tables full of records and tapes and CDs and fun stuff, a lot of releases from my label, TPOS, a lot of uh, new and used vinyl, um, Lord Willing and the Creeks Don't Rise, the weather will be good, and you can come to Southbury and hang out with moi at moi table, and it'll be like Tent Talks Tunes in real life under the big top. So mark that on your calendars if you're anywhere near Southbury, Connecticut, or Southington, Connecticut. I can never remember. There's an event page for it. You'll find it. The Punk Rock Flea Market, July 17th of this year. And then looking ahead to the future, of course, the Danbury Record and CD Expo in November on November 5th at our brand new location in the VFW Hall in downtown Danbury. Imagine a room full of dudes like myself and chicks like myself behind tables full of records and music all for sale. It's fun, believe me. So, all right, that's the bulletin board and the calendar. Let's check the mailbox. And this is uh, kind of what the entire show is going to revolve around, stuff that I've acquired lately in the field. We're going to start with the mailbox, and then we're going to get down to the field itself. Now going in chronological order. I've only got two things from the mailbox this week, but they're both very exciting. Anytime I see a box like this, this size and this shape, I get excited because this is a custom-made cassette mailer box. And this one is from my good pal Josh Stockinger. I don't know if, Josh, if you're watching, or if you want to comment maybe later, Stockinger or Stockinger? Don't know how to pronounce your last name. Stockinger with a G. Josh has a really cool eBay store called Gruesome Gifts. And Josh shares a very similar sense of humor to my sense of humor, which is dark, verging on fatalistic. He might even verge more, more toward the fatalistic side of things. You know, this dude can find humor in many grotesque situations. Uh, the very name of his store, Gruesome Gifts, kind of sums it all up. So a mysterious box from Josh at Gruesome Gifts, which I did take the liberty of pre-digesting for you folks, because I just wanted to see what was in it. But let's just assume that we're here at the Newtown Post Office, right next to P.O. Box 3626 in Newtown. And I'm cracking this open for the first time. You can see it's got a very tasteful pizza sticker to seal it. This might as well be a cold opening because I can't get the thing open. Ah, there we go. Whoa, okay, we see by the side that yes, it is indeed something resembling a cassette. And we pop it out. And you look on the back. You see a spray-painted cassette case. But you flip it over on the front. And whoa, look at that. Can you guys see that? That is 3D art. <laughs> that is a discombobulated human skeleton on a painted backdrop inside of a cassette case. That, my friends, is art. That qualifies as art. It's portable, it's lightweight, it's made from a format that I love, which is a cassette case, and it was made by Josh at Gruesome Gifts. So thank you, Josh, for sending me this lovely piece of art. Um, my house has got a lot of art in it, and it's a good thing this thing is so small, because this, this guarantees that I will be able to find a spot for it. I'm going to rest it right now on the mail order desk. And this gruesome, disembodied little tiny skeleton inside of a cassette case is going to be staring at me for the entire episode this week of Tent Talks Tunes. How do you like them apples? Can I get an amen? Let's see if we have any art appreciators out there. Who likes art out there? Guido, do you like art? Ian, my old homeboy from uh, New York State, do you like art? Larry Mann, do you like art? Brian Zikafus, the guitar player for the Bloody Apostles, is in the house right now. Let's get a big salute for Brian, who is one heck of a visual artist himself. And I don't mind telling people that because this guy's stuff is good. 
So if you like the Bloody Apostles, or you're a fan of uh, extreme music, check out the Bloody Apostles. And if you want to see some really amazing visual art, check out Brian Zikafus, who is our guitar player, and that guy can sling a brush, man. So I'm going to assume, I don't know if there's a lag going on here, if you guys just don't like art, but I'm going to assume that you like art. Amen, my brethren and cisterns. Amen. I'll drink a toast to some art. And I'm going to save this cassette mailer just because it's got a pizza sticker on the outside of it. Makes it a pizza box. Okay, the other item that we got, which is very cool, and this was indeed the introductory title card for this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes, a large package with a Chicago return address. And I was not expecting anything large in the mail, so this was kind of a surprise. But then when I opened it up and I dug down deep... By the way, does anybody out there, or I should say, did anybody out there, or has anybody out there, has anybody out there been like myself? Anybody out there raised on Mad Magazine from the 60s and 70s primarily? Does anybody remember the, the great Mad Magazine cartoonist Al Jaffe? If you do, and I mean, once you've seen his work, once you've read Mad Magazine, you can't forget it. But Al Jaffe, he was one of my favorite artists on Mad Magazine in the 70s and uh, there was one cartoon strip he wrote and um, it had a little detail in the cartoon it said in, in the cartoon itself and it um i don't know exactly what context it was but it had the name doug deep d-o-u-g-d-e-e-p doug deep i thought that was the best pseudonym i'd ever heard in my life and every time I dig into something, I think about old Al Jaffe and his Doug Deep cartoon. So here I am being Doug Deep, digging deep, deeply digging, digging deeply to fish out the contents of this box that I found for you people. And when I looked at the contents of the box, I got it all out finally. It took a while. You'll notice, you can see right here, I'm, I'm up to my elbow up to my elbow in box i am like completely being sucked in by this this happens a lot you know I, I get really into my mail and i can't seem to get out of it but um i'm working on it i was digging deep into this box trying to get the things to show to you people and to share with you the delight that i experienced when i got the stuff out of this box there did it i dug deep and I saw, ha, 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 I know what's in this box, and I know why I got a giant-sized box from my pal Jay Gray. And you folks, if you people are record-collecting nerd geek freaks like myself, and if you're fans, and I know this might be where we get a little bit divisive, but hey, one of my favorite quotes about art, and I just saw this in my memory feed recently, I forget who said it, but... Art is not a mirror. Art is a hammer. And I believe that. I think that sums up the true nature and purpose of art better than any other old bromide I've ever, I've ever heard. Art is a hammer. It is not a mirror. And art takes many forms. So, Gigi Allen, love him or hate him, the guy was a musician. He had many different bands and released a lot of music. And in my opinion, the music is damn good. If the music was no good, nobody would care about Gigi Allen. But his music was great. So, there's a sticker from Gigi Allen and the Disappointments. And sure enough, this, is, this has been in the making for a long time. And I'm happy to say that I did play a role in its facilitation jay had the vision and he did the work but he created this is the kind of record collector stuff i effing adore check this out a square double-sided hand lathed picture disc with really i mean look at that that's the the layout and the art on that is beautiful jay actually had a recording of a Gigi Allen interview that I had never heard before. 
And my GGL and archive runs pretty deep and pretty wide. And I, th I thought I had heard everything. But, so, you know, Jay actually found this interview that I'd never heard before. And apparently no one else has ever heard before. And um, he said, you know what? I'm going to make me a lathed square record of it, along with some very rare rehearsal recordings with Gigi and the Disappointments from 1989. And he said he was going to make this, and but actually seeing it and holding it in my hands for the first time and, and looking at how beautifully it's put together and what a great layout it is, what a great layout it is and how well it's made, I am very, very excited to see and hear this. I haven't heard it yet. I just got it today. Only 25 made, and it comes with a CD version of it. I got number six of 25 with some more inserts and things, and more inserts and things, and a super, as, as if that weren't cool enough, and this is where the record collecting geekness really gets out of hand, as if the actual edition of 25 weren't enough, he sent me a test cut of the record, of which only three were made. It's got handwritten blank labels. And I, you know, it's really hard to, to really exhibit how cool these hand lathed records are in a two-dimensional format. Here in 3D, you can see the way that the light plays on the grooves. And, you know, you can see it and feel it. Hand, you know, handwritten labels. I've done I've done a lot of talk on Tent Talks Tunes about test pressings and stuff like that. Episodes of which, of course, are archived on my YouTube channel. So here's an actual, not only a, an extremely limited hand lathed record, but a test version of it. So Jay, thank you very much. I'm glad that I was able to play whatever role I could play in making it happen. And I don't know what the deal is on this, but uh, Jay Gray is on my friends list. So if any of you super fanatical, maniacal GG collectors are out there and want one of these, I, I would imagine you would look up Jay and send him a message. Jay, if you're watching now and these aren't totally sold out, maybe post some information in the comments and let people know how they can reach you and get one of these. Because I think they should be got. And just as a teaser, by the way, a toast to hand laid records. This is, uh, as far as my purposes are concerned with my label, TPOS, a bit of a teaser, bit of a teaser for a release that's coming out on TPOS relating, of course, relating, of course, to Mr. G.G. Allen himself. So you've been warned. You've seen the goods, and you know there's something to look forward to in the future. Mazel tov. Let's check the monitor and see who's watching. We got John Adam from North Carolina. How we do that? Gary Childs says, yes, he had a big mad collection from the 60s and 70s. Had. Gary, had. You're breaking my heart. You're reminding me of me because I at one time had a large collection and I wish I still had them. Greg Crawford says, cracked magazine. Yes, cracked. Uh, every month, Mad would come out like at the beginning of the month, and then Cracked would come out in the middle of the month. So we always had something to read and to hide from the teachers in fourth grade. <laughs> All right, enough of this monitoring. You know, when, when you when you pick up the phone and you start staring at it, you also get lost, kind of like getting lost in a big box of cool mail. Whew. All right, that was the mail. Only two items, but two really good items to share with all you people out there. Now we've got a big pile of in-person, real-life scores to show and tell. A little bit of backdrop on where I've been and what I've been doing. Um, I just got back from a whirlwind trip to the great state of North Carolina. And when I say whirlwind, I mean whirlwind. The schedule basically went like this. I woke up way too early last Thursday so I could be so, so I could answer my summons to jury duty. So I could so I could be a good citizen and report for jury duty. And 
to put it very shortly and very bluntly, I was not in any mood to serve on any jury. Did not want to do it. Still don't want to do it. Not in the mood to serve on a jury. But when you get the summons, you got to go and at least go through the pretense of being there. And um, I was all ready. I was ready for action. I figured that when they called me up for the voir dire, that I was going to give them an earful about what I thought of their process. And it wasn't going to be nice. Speaking as a tax-paying citizen here, kids. Um, so, you know, we sit in the jury room and they show us the videos about our civic responsibility and they explain the whole process. And this is all happening at 9 o'clock in the morning. And people, I usually go to bed around 4.30 in the morning. I'm a night owl rock and roller on, on a night owl rock and roll schedule. Usually by the time the clock ticks 9 a.m., I'm like just really getting into my deep REM sleep. So to be awake in a courthouse at 9 a.m. is absolute torture for yours truly. It is rough. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm staying awake. You know, I'm really, you know, I'm not making any pretenses at being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but I am keeping my I am keeping my eyes open. I am sitting more or less upright. Actually, I was sitting more like this, watching the video, stretch out as far as I could stretch out, trying to be as comfortable as I could in this stupid chair in the jury selection room, watching the film. Then, then some judge comes out and talks about our civic responsibilities, and I'm, I see him, I hear him. And they show us another video. And then it is announced that our case is indeed going forth and that we are indeed going to be subjected to voir dire, which is where they determine our eligibility as jurors. And this is where I've got my whole list. I've got my whole Jeremiah ready, baby. I am ready to tell it like it is when it comes to my opinion of the system. So the lawyers come out and they immediately start selling themselves, you know, projecting their images, throwing shadows, you know, speaking their lingo, talking their talk. And I'm still like really trying to stay awake. And they go through what the case is about and the blah, 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 and the yak, yak, yak. And the lawyer who's doing all the yakking and blabbing says, okay, we're going to call you guys in for voir dire. First thing we need to know is, is there anybody here who's got a scheduling con... And before he even said the word conflict, he said scheduling, he said conflict. And my hand went up, baby. Loud and proud. And I sat up. Tall. Scheduling conflict? Yes, sir. That would be me. Hello. Hello. Scheduling conflict. Yes. Yes. And so uh, the head lawyer said, oh, well, we, we've got our first uh, scheduling conflict back there. You know, they wrote down my name and everything. And a bunch of other people had scheduling conflicts as well. They're sitting with their hands up. So they take down all the names. They go into the jury room and they start calling everybody in one by one to see what their scheduling conflict was. I figured they'd call me first since I was the loudest and the proudest when it came to scheduling conflicts. But no, they had some kind of random selection process where they didn't call me first. And now I'm pissed off again, so I get back down and figure I'll hunker down and relax a little bit. So they call in some people. I notice that they're actually going back into the room and coming out very quickly with sheets of paper. I take this as a good sign, but I'm still relaxed because I don't know when they're going to call me. But they call me like fourth or fifth. I get up go into the jury selection room and they say hello I say hi they say so you've got a scheduling conflict I said yes I do and they said well what's the nature of your scheduling conflict I said I'm leaving to go to Charlotte North Carolina tonight on rock and roll band business and I'm going to be out of town until the night of June 23rd and then of course the trial was going to start on June 21st. So the lawyer said, ah, that definitely um, would be a conflict. I said, a wee smidge. 
and the lawyer sort of chuckled in his lawyerly fashion. And um, he said, okay. And so one of the other lawyers, I said, um, so uh, what, what instrument do you play? I said, I play the bass guitar excruciatingly loud. And he said, oh, hmm, okay. Um, what are the name, what's the name of the band you're in? And I said, well, I'm in three. One's called Anti-Scene, one's called The Bloody Apostles, and one's called Profanatica. And, um, sorry, not Profanatica. <laughs> Anti-Scene, Bloody Apostles, and, um, ugh, my, my details are getting scrambled because it was so early in the morning that I don't remember. <laughs> but I definitely said Anti-Scene, I said the bloody apostles and um so the lawyer said oh okay i i think i've heard of them and i said you haven't heard of us you, you've not heard of us um and he said well what kind of music do you play i said it is extremely loud anti-social kind of anti-music really and they were like oh <laughs> Um, so it's not not sort of the mu not the sort of music that you would hear uh, in an elevator. <laughs> I said, sir, if our music was played in an elevator, the cable would snap. And they were like, oh, ha 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 ha. Okay, you're out. They gave me a little scrap of paper, and I was dismissed. I just know that I said for a fact, anti scene and bloody apostles. To a room full of lawyers. I think I might have even said Profanatica. I don't know. I'm sure. I think, in fact, I'm pretty sure I did. Either way, they didn't know what the H to make of it, and I was out of there. So that was Thursday. So Thursday, I'm already up earlier than I want to be with no sleep whatsoever. I got to go home, do all my packing and prepping to hit the road to go to North Carolina, which I did. I left around 9 p.m. that night, drove as long as I possibly could crashed out for a while, woke up, and hit an excellent record store. And this is where we get down to what we're talking tunes about, the acquisitions in the field of cool records. The first record store I found, pardon me while I drink a little bit. And by the way, if anybody has jury duty experience, I'd like to hear about it, to see how it... Um, Stacks up with my experiences. Uh, Mike Lesser said that um, he got out by telling them that he had severe ADHD, which is probably an extremely valuable and viable resource when it comes to getting out of jury duty. And um, Jay Gray says he might have one or two that might be for sale of the G.G. Allen picture disc. So there, you guys know and you've been warned. Anyway... Um, I found a really cool record store. Was not expecting to find one in Shepherdstown, Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Shepherdsville, West Virginia. Anyway, it was called Admiral Analogs Audio Assortment. Now, part of my shtick as I make my living by rock and roll, besides playing in bands such as Anti Scene, The Bloody Apostles, uh, Ultra Bunny, etc 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 is I have my record label TPOS which besides being on Discogs eBay and Bandcamp I have a physical product which I take around the record stores all over this great country of ours and when I'm making the commute back and forth to North Carolina I try to hit as many record stores as I possibly can on the way down and on the way back and what I will do is find a record store, walk in with a crate of my goods and say, hey guys, I got a label. I release a lot of degenerate weirdo outsider stuff. Are you interested in buying any of it? The answer usually is yes. Every now and again, I come across some nudnik who just does not comprehend the quality of my label. Luckily, they're in a very small minority. The, the answer is usually yes. And at, at Admiral Analogs, audio assortment in, in West Virginia, we did a lot of business. We, he bought a lot of my stuff. And in return, I trawled his bins, finding cool things. The first thing I found that was really super cool that floated my boat, and this shows you how 
synchronous things can be sometimes. On the last episode of Tent Talks Tunes, I talked about some records I had found in the field by the great Clarence Reed, a.k.a. Blowfly. And wouldn't you know it, this week I can show you an honest, actual Blowfly album that I found in the wild, The Weird World of Blowfly. This, my friends, is pure genius. That is the front cover. That is the back cover. I wish that you could see the captions on the photos. They are hilarious. They definitely live up to the title, The Weird World of Blowfly. Blowfly was a genius. Just a, a thumbnail capsulation of Blowfly. His real name was Clarence Reed. And for a long time, he had a career as a songwriter, writing great rhythm and blues and dance tunes and disco tunes for a huge array of, of uh, performers. And at some point, he assumed the guise of Blowfly, who is basically a, a dirty songwriter. And he later became a dirty rapper. But it's all like dirty, nasty it's kind of like eighth grade juvenile pee pee poo poo toilet humor, which normally I don't think is very funny, but Blowfly does it right. Kind of the same way that Rudy Ray Moore did it right. You know, Wild Man Steve, um, these guys, I can only take so much of it, but for the time that I can take it, it's hilarious. So Blowfly, and I really have a fondness for Blowfly because... Um, you know, I, I met, I, I can't say that I was friends with him, but I knew the guy. He played an incredible in-store at my rec, at my record store, Trash American Style. Whenever he and the band were in town, they would stop by. They would buy wrestling masks from me and just hang out a little bit. So really, really like Blowfly. Big fan and uh, friendly with. So I was really, really stoked to find this Blowfly record. It's a later pressing. It's not an original Weird World Pressing, you can tell because it's not the tip-on thick cardboard sleeve. It's the thinner, glossy sort of cardstock sleeve with the white inside. And the vinyl is just... When you've been doing this as long as I have, you can tell just by pulling the record out and feeling it if it's a vintage pressing or not. It's, it's, a, it's a newer pressing. But it's got the authentic Weird World labels, and it's in beautiful mint condition. Finding an original Blowfly record in anything other than beat-up condition is pretty difficult. Because these were party records. You know, they got played at parties, and they got totally destroyed, usually. So to find a good condition Blowfly record of any ilk is a definite treat for yours, truly. So that is a wonderful thing to find in the field when you're doing business with a record store in person. Found a couple other things. Hey, wouldn't you know it? I found a, a copy of the record of a record by the band I'm in, Anti Scene, Blood of Freaks. It's not original, it's a reissue on TKO, which is our current record label. It's on beautiful red vinyl. The original came out, I believe, in 1991 on a label called Ajax. And the reissue, they only made a thousand of it, it's, even the reissue is way out of print. So, as, as I've said many times, I'm not just the bass player in the band, I'm a fan. So whenever I see an anti-scene record that I don't have in the field, I pick it up. Especially when I'm trading with the record shop in question. So now I can say I've got an original and a repress. And I'm very happy about it. Only a thousand on red vinyl. It's mine, baby. Mine, 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 mine. Also, let me wet my whistle a little bit here. <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> excuse me again this is real life brought to you a lot of coughing hacking gagging and gasping <clears throat> it's the first day of summer but spring is still springing all around me in my little cabin in the woods it is verdant and green outside and the pollen count is really high so uh, it's all right there kids speaking of anti-scene I should mention that the entire reason why I was making this... Well, I'll get to that in a minute. We're still on day one and a half of my trip 
my whirlwind trip to North Carolina and back. And I'm in West Virginia digging through the record store and finding other stuff. Now, I've uh, people who've known me for a very, very, very long time know that for many, many years I was completely, utterly anti-CD. I hated CDs. And once again, if you look on my YouTube channel and go through the archived episodes of Tent Talks tunes that I have, I will tell you in detail why I hated CDs in the 90s. My opinion has turned around somewhat. Nowadays, I like CDs. CDs are okay in my book. Took a while for me to get to that point of view, but I'm fine with it now. I'm comfortable with it now. So I look for CDs that are cool, and I found something that uh, will be going with me to the devotional fan gathering, which is happening in Cleveland, Ohio in September of this year. I am not only performing, but um, I will be behind a table full of goods, full of merchandise, all related to Devo, of course, including this, what I think is extremely desirable CD reissue of the Oh No It's Devo album. This came out on Infinite Zero Records, which has the extremely distinctive Infinite Zero label on it. Infinite Zero was a label that was run by Henry Rollins. And Henry Rollins is one of those dudes who has taken uh, whatever you want to call it, fame, stardom, major label success, and actually plowed his money back into some very worthwhile endeavors. And in the 90s, he had this label, Infinite Zero, which reissued albums basically that he loved, like his favorite records that had been completely out of print forever and ever and ever. And his label actually reissued some of the more obscure Devo albums. Infinite Zero did Duty Now for the Future, New Traditionalists, Shout, and Oh No, It's Devo. And each one had bonus cuts and were mastered beautifully. I mean, if, if there's going to be a good sounding CD version of a, of a Devo album or a Gang of Four record or um, I forget what else he did, but everything he did was really well done and they sound really good. This is the best mastered version of Oh No, It's Devo on CD I've, I've heard yet. It sounds pretty close to vinyl in terms of depth and warmth. Really, really good. And this has been out of print since the 90s. And they're not particularly rare, but I don't, really, I don't find them that often in the field. I think most people who bought them initially held on to them. So I was pleasantly surprised to find this in the bin on Infinite Zero with all the bonus cuts and everything. Listen to this one a couple of times on my long, arduous drive back and forth from North Carolina. And this is also an album that um, is fairly divisive in the Devo community. There are people who love it. There are people who don't like it. I'm, I'm of the, I'm kind of in between. It's like, I don't actively dislike this record, but when it comes to listening to Devo, it's not the first one I go to. It's usually on the bottom, like toward the bottom of the list of Devo records that I put on for just casual listening. Whenever I do put it on, I like it. You know, there's really not a bad song on this record. But for whatever reason, I don't know. I just don't ever gravitate towards this one for listening. And it's also weird because this was the only Devo record that I did not run out and buy immediately when it came out in 1982. Every single Devo record from the first one to the most recent one, I've gotten the day it came out, basically, but not this one. This was in a weird time of my life when I was kind of over Devo. And I, I did not ever have a copy of this until quite a bit after it was released. So maybe that's got something to do with it. I don't know. Some kind of weird psychology at play with my relationship to Oh No, It's Devo. But hey, whatever. Now I've got like 14 versions of it on vinyl and at least two versions of it on CD. I'll be taking this with me to Cleveland, Ohio to put on the merch table at this year's devotional Devo fan gathering.
And if you want to know more about this year's devotional fan gathering, cruise the net. You will find information about it. Probably the best place to go would be my friend Michael Pilmer's website, Devo, excuse me, DevoObsesso.com. Devo-Obsesso.com. If anybody out there thinks I'm obsessed with Devo, you should check out Michael Pilmer's website. Now that is Devo Obsesso. And he's got a full page devoted to this year's devotional. A toast. I drink a nice long swig of Danbury tap water from a plastic jug to devotional. And also, Lord willing, and the pressing plants don't all mysteriously burn down over the next couple of months, I should have an exciting new TPOS product with me at Devotional at well, as well. No revelations just yet. Just saying. I will also say that if you want one, you have to be at Devotional in person to get it. That's all I'm saying. Now, what other stuff have we scored out in the field? Hmm? Well, actually, <laughs> this is not vinyl. This is not records at all. And first, let's check the monitor real quick and make sure I'm still running live. I am. Gary says he loves Oh No. Fair enough. Mike says it was the fifth album pressure. The pressure was on by the fifth album. You better believe it. Oh, my gosh. Um... Okay, now this is where memory fails, because I hit a few record stores on my way back yesterday, and um, I don't remember the name of this one, but this is one of those record shops that um, it was actually really cool. It reminded me of my old place. Oh, hold on a minute. We have a problem. We have a problem. Oh, my God, we got a problem, and its name is Harry. Hey, boy. There he is, the world-famous Harry the Cat. Look at the camera. Be cute. <laughs> he doesn't want to, but he is. Listen to that guy purr. Hope you guys can hear the purr. There he is, the most reluctant cat internet star going. He's usually very camera shy, but he's on camera now. He doesn't, doesn't look like he cares very much either. Harry, are you with us? Are you even awake? What are you doing, guy? Oh, looks like Harry got into a fight. Look at that. Woo! Harry's the alpha male on this block, and he has to assert his dominance, and it looks like someone took a chunk out of his ear. My goodness. There's an orange tabby across the street who is the alpha male on the bottom half of the block. So they have these territorial disputes occasionally. We're going to put some peroxide on that later, boy. Shoot, scram, scat. Hope you guys liked that appearance by Harry the Cat. Not often seen, but always loved here on Tent Talks Tunes. Anyway, record store in Maryland that kind of reminded me of my record store in that it had a lot of stuff other than records. And they had, wouldn't you know, a stack of wacky packs. A big stack of wacky packs. Vintage wacky pack stickers from the 70s and from the 80s. I don't know if you guys out there, anybody from the Mad Magazine generation I was talking about earlier will probably appreciate Wacky Packs. We got Hawaiian Punks. We got Baby Runt. We got Salem. Don't smoke them. Salem. <laughs> we got Evil Time. Drink Mix. Mubeline, mascara. I mean, I could go on all day with these things. Shot wheels. When I was in the third, fourth, fifth, and maybe into the sixth grade, I got into trouble with my teachers for having wacky packs. Because, you know, <laughs> sore deodorant. <laughs> oh my god, I love this. And the, um, of course, on the back, you've got the puzzle pieces for uh, Beast Ball and Wormy packages. Here you go. Dumbs for the dummy. Motorola. 
I never get tired of this. I, you know, I was a good kid. I was always on the honors list and AP classes, and everybody's telling me I was a smart kid and all that. I really didn't get into trouble for very much, ever. <laughs> Blunderbread. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't get into trouble for very much, but I remember specifically getting into big trouble with Mrs. Coven when I was in the fourth grade for passing my wacky packs around the class when we should have been reading a book or something like that. And um, she she confiscated my wacky packs. First time, she confiscated them. She gave them back at the end of the day. Second time she confiscated them, she did not give them back. And I was crushed. And I realize now, of course, that was a violation of my constitutional rights and my right to my personal property. And I could have fought that shit in court. I could have had a big old case with the ACLU or at least the local police over my personal property. But in the fourth grade, I didn't know that. So Mrs. Coven got to add to her collection of wacky packs for free. To this day, I'm damaged by that. Mrs. Coven, if you're out there and if you've got a heart of any sort, here's my mailing address. You remember me, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Mrs. Coven, if you're out there, you've got any kind of conscience or you respect the legalities of this great country's property laws, you will return my wacky packs. The address is here. Balls in your court. Just saying. But yes, I do love my wacky packs. Horrid deodorant. Never get tired of it. So basically, did the long, wicked drive to Charlotte, North Carolina on little to no sleep because of jury duty or the attempt thereat, got to Charlotte, North Carolina and went straight to Anti-Scene Rehearsal Studios so that we could get our brand new, brand new guitar player, Walt Wheat of the Clayton, Hannibal, MT, and Wheat lineup Dig the slogan, kids. Clayton, Hannibal, MT, and Wheat. This is now the team to beat. These four guys right here. Walt Wheat from Mississippi's very own Before I Hang. An excellent band. Excellent band. I was playing some of them on CD on the way back yesterday. So to have Walt Wheat in the band is definitely a bit of kapow in the uh, powder mixture. So rehearsals to get Walt acclimated to the anti-scene way of doing things. And uh, the rehearsals, rehearsals went really well. We definitely kicked some butt. We kicked some hiney. We kicked some ass. We kicked some booty. We kicked left cheek and right cheek. We didn't necessarily break our foot off in anybody's ass, but we definitely lodged it in deep. The ass of mediocrity got whooped for two days in a row in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I would say that Walt Wheat has firmly established his place in the lineup. I mean, look, we got a picture. We got a picture and everything. So we did that. And it's kind of the same deal. The rock and roll action was so intense. Once again, I didn't sleep very well because... Any of you performers out there, do you know what it's like when you play a super killer gig and you're so wound up that you can't sleep that night? I get that a lot. If the gig is really good, I'm just like, I'm still buzzing from it all night long. And that'll happen uh, from a particularly good recording session or a particularly good rehearsal. You know, any kind of artistic endeavor that really, really succeeds just... You know, it'll get me revved up to the point where I can't sleep. And that's what happened on Saturday night. The rehearsal was so good and we sounded so awesome that I was just like buzzing all night long. So, okay, there's another night without sleep. 
Sunday, we get together, we do it again. Fantastic. I rolled tape, recorded the whole thing because uh, we'd like to have a giant reservoir of material for future use in anti-scene. And I figured it was only right that since I got Mad Brother Ward's last rehearsal and last gig recorded, why not have Walt Wheat's first rehearsal recorded? Who knows? Might be able to use it for something someday. So that went really well. And then once again, I'm on the road. I'm moving. I went up to Hickory, North Carolina to have some visiting and take care of some business. And then uh, drove back once again on very, very little sleep. And I found some stuff. And this is the last item I'm going to talk about here. And by the way, I mentioned the possibility of doing a top 10 list. I actually wrote a top 10 list. And I found that whenever I do a top 10 list, I end up taking about half the show. So we don't have time for a top 10 list. I might in the future devote an entire show to doing a couple of top 10 lists because they're a lot of fun and uh, when i've done top 10 lists before they've engendered a lot of discussion so top 10 lists i got plenty and that's a, a page i've stolen from jeff clayton's book and if you guys want to see jeff clayton himself do a top 10 list go to the anti-scene facebook page every tuesday at 5 p.m for Jeff Clayton's show called Break On Through. I think he's like me. He might not do a top 10 list every episode, but he has done plenty, and there will be plenty more. So this, that's a page I stole from his book. Right there. Right there. And I will read from that page one of these days. But anyway, i got some more acquisitions to talk about, and there's quite a few of them, but they fit into one genre. So it's going to be a fairly quick and easy acquisition. It started when I was digging through some bins and I came across this Rolling Stones album, which is Between the Buttons. And my trained eye noticed immediately that this is not a regular stereo pressing, but a mono pressing, a monophonic pressing. As you can see on the bottom of the cover, mono. And just to make sure that it was indeed mono, I took it out. And oh, sure enough, it's got the red label, mono, London design. Now, London, which was the U.S. version of DECA, differentiated their mono pressings from their stereo pressings. And I know the, the resolution is not that great. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. You guys can see one example of the red mono London label. Mono pressings were red, stereo pressings were blue. And the stereo pressings are really common. You find them all the time. The mono pressings are not... Okay, here's another variant. This is an earlier version of a London red label mono. You can note the different typeface. I think we've got a few different... I found all of these together all these great rolling stones mono pressings um well, there's some stereo we don't want to look at that one we're talking about mono kids oh, this one basically mono pressings oh, here's a different variation an unboxed london mono there's a few of them basically rolling stones mono records are not they're not necessarily rare but finding them in any kind of good condition that's rare. It's kind of like what I said earlier about the Blowfly records. You know, Rolling Stones records were basically they were party records. They got played at parties and social gatherings, and a bunch of snotty punks were playing them. So, and they were usually played on really cheap record players. You know, the stereo records at the time cost more than mono records. I think they were a, a full dollar more than a mono record. And when you adjust that for inflation, I don't know what it comes out to, but it's a it's a huge amount. You know, it's basically, excuse me, like say if a monophonic record sold for two ninety eight, and a stereo record sold for three ninety eight, that's a thirty percent price difference. And when you're talking about nineteen sixties dollars, 
that's a lot of damn money. I mean, let's think about it. When I started, when I worked my first job in 1981, I was making minimum wage, and minimum wage at that time was three dollars and thirty-five cents an hour. So when you're making three thirty-five an hour, a dollar is a lot. So I can even I can only imagine what minimum wage was like, you know, 15 years before that. So you can imagine what a dollar meant in the 1960s. So to to spend the money on a stereo record meant that you were almost automatically better off and had better gear and took better care of your records, whereas the cheaper mono versions were the ones that were played at parties, on cheap record players, and had the beer spilled on them, and they were danced on and thrown across the room, and they were owned by kids a lot of times who didn't know how to take care of records. So mono pressings from the 60s, even though you can find them, you hardly ever find them in anything remotely resembling mint condition. And uh, I was extremely lucky to find some of these monos in pretty good condition. I don't know if you guys can see how the grooves shine. And you can see the sheen on these. But they're pretty decent. And I've played every single one of these. And they all sound pretty dang decent. These, by the way, are all for sale. The, the records I showed you before were not for sale, but these Rolling Stones mono records are for sale. And while none of them are in perfect stone mint condition, they sound just fine. Like There's, there's some surface noise, maybe, but no skips, no gouges. They all play okay. The one that's actually in the best condition is the one that's the hardest to find in mono, and of course is the record that nobody likes. I actually got myself a mono copy of Satanic Majesties with the 3D lenticular cover and the inner sleeve, and I re-sleeved it. And that is a Puka red label mono copy of Satanic Majesties, if my camera will zoom in on it. Don't know if it will. But there it is. And I'm actually willing to part with all of these. So if anybody wants a nice collection of Stones mono albums, let me know. We'll talk. I'm partial to the mono albums because, as you may know, the Beatles, and I think it's safe to say that the Stones, conceived of their original 60s albums in mono. Stereo mixes were made after the fact by varying studio personnel. Um, in the case of the Beatles, anybody from George Martin to some guy at EMI could make a stereo mix of a Beatles record and send it out to anybody who wanted a stereo mix. I'm going to assume that the same was the case for the Rolling Stones, because... You know, the stereo albums are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. They're cool. But the mono albums have a certain savoir-faire to them. They just have a certain purity, a certain depth, a certain richness to their sound. I think that might have something to do with the fact that the mono records were all cut in the 1960s, close to the source, close to the time that they were recorded, so you're using, you're using fresh production tapes to make these mono records. Some of the stereo records I've heard made from the 80s and even into the 90s were, you could tell they were made from like multi-generation tapes, you know, third generation, fourth generation, who knows what generation production tapes. And each generation that's removed from the master results in a loss of sound quality. With the monos, you don't get that. The monos were cut at the time from the tapes and mixed as conceived by the band. So the monos, I think if you really want to hear the way these records were supposed to sound in the 60s are the way to go. And that's why I always snap them up whenever I find them. And I was very pleased to find a few Stones mono records, all of them in at least playable condition. Uh, listening to this one, I had, I had to reassess my opinion of Between the Buttons. I never really liked it that much, 
mainly based on the the opinion of Roy Carr, who is a Rolling Stones fanatic writer. He wrote a book called The Rolling Stones Illustrated Record. He also wrote for New Musical Express in England. And he gave Between the Buttons a very low review in The Rolling Stones Illustrated Record book. So I, I never really took it that seriously. But playing it again the other day, it's good. It's really good. It's it's um it's much better it's better than aftermath, for example. And this is where I want everybody to chime in if anybody has a strong opinion on the stones. Um I think that Between the Buttons is a better album than Aftermath. And Aftermath, of course, gets all the laudatory reviews because oh it's the first ever all original Jagger Richard album. It's the uh, groundbreaking album. It's an okay record. It's an okay record. You know, I bought it in 1978 or 79. Didn't like it that much then. I played a copy of Aftermath fairly recently, and I still don't like it that much. It's got some good stuff on it. You can definitely hear them, you know, starting to spread their wings a little bit and stretch out a little bit and try new ideas. But I don't think that the Stones had really mastered the craft of writing an entire album by then. It was their first attempt at it, but they hadn't mastered it. I think they got a lot better at it with Between the Buttons. The production is a lot better on Between the Buttons. It's a lot more imaginative. You know, like Yesterday's Papers, for example, has got a fantastic backing track. This is an album where Brian Jones really shines as a multi-instrumentalist. This is right before he started totally falling apart. But... Man, when he when he was in the studio recording this album, he's all over this record. And I think it's his multi-instrumental virtuosity that really makes this record. Even some of the weaker songwriting efforts on this album shine because of the way he plays the various instruments on them. And it's my opinion that if you took Between the Buttons and Aftermath and boiled them down to a single album, you would you would have something that would be on par with Rubber Soul. Or maybe even Revolver. You know, if like the Beatles and the Stones went back and forth, tit for tat, releasing singles and releasing albums throughout their career, I believe that an album that came out in maybe early 1967 that was a cross between the best songs on this album and the best songs on Aftermath would have definitely given Rubber Soul or maybe Revolver a real run for its money. My opinion, as it stands now, Between the Buttons has emerged as a record that I actually have started to like a lot, where I never really did before. <clears throat> and of course, Satanic Majesties, I've talked about Satanic Majesties quite a bit in the past. Once again, look up the ar archived episodes on my YouTube channel. In a nutshell, I will say that this is not a psychedelic record. This is a Moroccan record. This is a Northern African record. If you look at it that way, look at it as a, and I hate, hate to use this term, but I'm going to use it anyway just for easy reference, a world music album. If you look at it as an album made by dudes who were hanging out in Morocco and were completely besotted, with Moroccan music, then this album makes a lot of sense. Throw some psychedelia into the mix just because it was of the times. This is a Northern African record. I love this record. And it sounds pretty damn good in mono, too. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this record was conceived as a stereo record, but the mono mix, mwah, especially on this early pressing taken from the early tapes, sounds pretty damn good. So I was absolutely delighted to be in the field at, at actual record stores finding really cool stuff and bringing them back to share with you, my frantic fans, my loyal listeners, and my vibrating viewers. Muy fun grande. Mas divertiendo para ti. Para mi. Para nuestros. Yay. That's for all my friends in Nogi Town. I can almost speak your language. Not quite, but almost. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up this week's episode of 
10th Talks Tunes. I want to thank everybody for digging what I was laying down. I have been seeing a lot of comments coming up on the monitor. I'll be checking them out after I sign off. Um, I, I welcome and appreciate all comments. I learn a lot from everybody who tunes in, and that is at least as much fun as sitting here imparting. I really enjoy learning about stuff from what you folks have to say. So by all means, keep them coming, keep the conversation flowing, and um, let's do it again. Let's say maybe next Wednesday, perhaps at 7 p.m., maybe here live on YouTube, or I should say live on Facebook. If you can't be here on Facebook, then yes, archived on YouTube, maybe. Let's make it a date. Let's say it's going to happen. Let's assume it's going to happen. Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise. So that's basically it. I'll see you guys in about 167 hours time. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.